This next part of the course deals with demand theory. You will have heard the expression supply and demand. Some of you are studying economics and you will have some deeper ideas that we're just going to scratch the surface of. We're going to start by looking at how price and quantity relate to one another. Specifically, as you change the price of a product, what happens to the quantity you sell? We're going to look later on at how the quantity and the price work together in order to determine the revenue, in other words, the total amount of income you get with your business, and also how the costs relate to that. Because even with a simplistic model, we'll find there's some fairly sophisticated mathematics going on behind the scenes that we can use to determine the sweet spot, the perfect price to set in order to get the optimal amount of sales. You don't want to set the price too low or you won't make very much profit with each one you sell. But on the flip side, you don't want to set the price so high that you hardly sell any of your product. This example is a nice way to illustrate it. So you go up to a stall at the Glastonbury Festival and somebody is painstakingly etching names onto single grains of rice. It's a thing. They do it. Look it up on Etsy. Um, for £10, you can get your name written on a grain of rice for you. And they'll stick it in a little pendant and you get to take it away. Or on the stall next door, your name on a baked potato for a pound. Grab a Sharpie, Dave, Tom, Bob. They're the two different strategies and each of them has its own advantages and disadvantages. So, for instance, the rice, you're making £10 for a single grain of rice. That's a pretty good deal. It's going to take you a little while to write out the name. It's a specialised skill set. But leaving that to one side for the time being, think about how many people are going to pay for that, given that it costs £10. Your materials cost a lot less. Um, presumably, when you get good at it, you can get reasonably quick at the process, I assume. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. It's not a good way to make a living. Um, but you are limiting the number that you can sell by putting the price so high. So in this case, the choice is you set a high price so that you get a much larger profit per item that you sell. But the trade off is that you don't sell very many. On the other hand, your name on a baked potato, you have a low price. So the profit won't be so large, but you will sell a larger quantity. So you're going to make um, more money in the long run by selling lots of things, potentially, than just by selling a few things. But both of those factors are important. So the amount of profit you make per item is important and the number of items you sell is important. You can see that it's not a straightforward, you should make things cheaper calculation. If you make it too cheap, you won't make any profit at all and there's no point selling the items. If you make it too expensive, you won't sell any at all and there's no point trying to run your business. There's got to be a sweet spot somewhere in the middle and that's what we're going to be looking into. Let's start with some key terms. We need to be clear exactly about what we mean when we use these specific terms. Some of these words will appear similar to us or they'll feel like they mean the same thing. So we need to be crystal clear on what means what. We'll start with price. The price of something is different to the cost for the business. The price is how much you decide to charge your customers. If you can make um, a greetings card for 30p, that may be the cost of the greetings card to you to purchase the materials. But if you sell it for £1.20, then the price is what you choose to sell it for. £1.20 will be the price, even if the cost is only 30p. The quantity, which is sometimes known as demand, that's why this is demand theory, that's the number of items you will sell. So how much of the stuff you're going to be able to shift. And that's something that you don't directly control. You can't determine exactly how many items you sell. You could determine how many you make, but even if you make a thousand greetings cards, if you decide that you're going to charge 50 pounds each for them, unless they're really, really good greetings cards, you're going to struggle to shift them. What's important is not how many you manage to make, but how many you manage to sell. And the amount that you can sell will usually be determined to a large degree by the price. Revenue or income is how much money you get. This is the total amount of money that you get coming into the business and it ignores any money that you have spent. So if you charge £1.20 for a greetings card and you sell 10 greetings cards, then your revenue is £12. £1.20 times 10. Simple as that. That's the money that comes in. At the end of the day, when you count up what's in the box, that's your revenue. 
but before you go home and start spending it all you need to remember how much you spent initially on the materials or how much it cost you to rent your pitch or to fuel your van or to run your generator and that's where the next bit comes in this is the costs or the expenditure for your business um, there are lots of businesses that have a very very high revenue in the hundreds of thousands or the millions but they also have very very high costs or expenditure and it's the gap between them that determines whether a business is successful or not. I worked in a factory that had a, a turnover or a revenue of um, I think a couple of million pounds a year but they were still making a loss. They had a business plan that was working towards becoming profitable within a few years but at that moment their revenue although it was in the millions was outweighed by the costs which were also in the millions just slightly more millions. So the really important part is the last bit the profit and this potentially could be negative in which case you might call it a loss if your company makes a loss it means that no matter how much money they had coming in they had more money going out if they have a profit it means the amount of money coming in is greater than the amount of money going out so a business that has ten thousand pounds coming in and five thousand pounds going out makes a five thousand pound profit a business that has a hundred thousand pounds coming in and ninety five thousand pounds going out also makes a £5,000 profit. The percentage profit is smaller with that second one. A lot of money is going back and forth, but the actual amount they make at the end of the year is exactly the same. The next thing to think about before you move on is to ask yourself, if you're a business owner, which of these things do you think you should be trying to increase? And which, if any, do you think you should be trying to decrease? Can you affects the price, the quantity, the revenue, the costs, the profit, and if so, how would you do it? Pause for a moment, have a think, which of them you want to make bigger, which you want to make smaller, and why. Try to justify it for yourself. Okay, the answer, and the only answer that is definitely the right answer for the first one, is profit. You might be thinking, why don't we increase the price? We'll make more money. Have a think about what might happen if you increase the price based on what we said with the earlier slides. If you charge too much money, you won't sell very many of your product. And at the end of the day, the business's job is to maximize profit. That's the only thing we care about. The other things will end up messing with and tweaking and adapting, but only insofar as they help us to increase the profit. Profit can be increased in various ways. Um, but the profit is not automatically going to increase just by charging a larger amount. You might wonder why when you go to a shop, the prices of certain items are low. Well, the reason for that is not because the shop is trying to be kind and to make sure that you can buy the stuff that you need for a reasonable price. It's because if they charged any more money, they would end up making less profit, which seems counterintuitive. But if I go to Sainsbury's and they're selling rice for three pounds a bag and then I go to Lidl and they're selling rice for two pounds a bag well I'm going to start shopping at Lidl and I'm going to buy my rice from Lidl and Sainsbury's won't sell any rice this is essentially how free markets work so if lots of companies are selling a similar product for different prices then the lowest price chances are that's where people are going to go to buy that product and if nobody buys your product because your product is too highly priced you have very few choices. You either drop the price or you stop selling the product. You're not going to be able to sell any if it's too highly priced. Of course, there are other nuances involved. You can change your product to the point where it feels like a different product. You can make it a premium version. You can make a unique selling point, etc. We don't get into any of those subtleties here. We're going to focus on a basic idea of if you increase the price, you will reduce the quantity you sell. If you decrease the price, you will increase the quantity you sell. But even the quantity, you might be thinking we want to increase the quantity. Well, the problem with that is if you increase the quantity that you're trying to sell, how do you go about doing that? Usually the way you can increase the quantity you sell, the only way you can directly affect that as a business is by decreasing the price. Now, if you decrease the price too much, then it drops below the cost to you of making the product, which means that you're no longer going to be profitable. So it's not always the right thing to try increasing the price. It's not always the right thing to try increasing the quantity by reducing the price. There's a, a subtle art to it and you've got to find the optimal point. In terms of decreasing, 
Well, potentially you might have said, I want to decrease costs. And to some extent that's correct. Um, but there's something a bit more subtle involved in there. If you just say, I want to decrease the cost of my business. Well, the simplest way to minimize your cost is not to make anything, not to sell anything. But of course you won't make any profit that way. If you want to make profit, you have to spend money to make money is the phrase. If you don't have any costs, then you're not going to be able to produce any product and you won't be able to make any profit. So there will be variable costs. They're the costs associated directly with the things that you're making. If you are selling baked potatoes, then you're going to need to buy lots of baked potatoes if you want to sell lots of baked potatoes. And the hope is that you will sell enough to make back the money that you spent. There are also fixed costs. So if you decided to rent a pitch at Glastonbury, you'll probably pay the same amount regardless of how much you sell. And that cost is something that you might look to reduce. So as long as you can get the same quality or a, a good enough quality, then you might find ways of reducing the variable cost per product, for instance. But it's not just a simple case of making your overall costs lower, because the most obvious way of doing that will be to make fewer things. And that's not necessarily going to do your profits any good. We're going to focus now on just the first two. We're concentrating on price versus quantity. We'll get to the revenue and costs and profit and how we can incorporate those later. But it's important that we focus specifically on these two to start with, get a clear idea in our heads of how these two link. So what's the key idea behind the price and quantity connection? Well, this is the key principle. And this, you could argue, is essentially the essence of demand theory. If the price you set per item goes up, the quantity you're able to sell goes down. That's basically it. Now think about what that would look like on a graph. Your demand function will be something that looks like this. Now potentially you could make a more sophisticated model that takes into account um, the fact that maybe there's a maximum number of items that you could ever sell no matter how cheap you make it. Um, but we're not going to get into price elasticity or anything like that. We're just going to talk about this standard model, which is linear. In other words, it's a straight line model. We say if you increase the price by a certain amount, you will reduce the quantity you can sell by a certain amount. And it's a fixed amount. So if you look closely at this graph, you can see if we have a price of, let's say, £2, then we can sell four items. That's how many items we'll sell. If we say, hey, these things cost two pounds, we'll have four people stop by and say, yeah, I'll buy one of those. Thank you very much. Of course, that will make us two times four. We'll get eight pounds altogether. If we increase the price a little bit, let's say we make the price four pounds, then we don't get so many people buying the item. We only get three people. But remember, we've doubled the price and we haven't halved the number of people who buy the item. So you could either sell four items for two pounds or you could sell three items for four pounds and selling three items for four pounds gets you 12 pounds of revenue, which is more than eight pounds. Now revenue increase is not automatically the same as profit increase. We also have to consider the costs involved and we'll get to that later. But for now, it's just worth noticing that for different prices, you may sell less, but it may not necessarily be a bad thing. At six pounds, you sell two items, which is getting you the same amount of money altogether as selling three items for four pounds. A few questions I've got about this as well. To start with, when we draw the graph, what is it that makes us decide to put P on the horizontal axis? Pause and see if you can answer this and then unpause. So hopefully, you've recognized the fact that we're talking about dependent and independent variables. If you think back to the first semester work we did, we had quite a bit of stuff on this. If we're talking about an independent variable, we're referring to something which is not affected by the other thing. In this case, I'm not going to change the price based on how many people buy the thing. I don't know ahead of time how many people are going to buy the thing. So how can I set the price based on that? It's quite tricky to make that work. It's more obvious to say if I set a higher price, then the quantity will be affected by that. So if I charge a small amount, the quantity as a result of that will be higher. And if I charge a large amount, the quantity as a result will be lower. So the quantity depends on the price. 
couple more questions. What would happen if I charged more than £10? Pause, have a think. According to this graph, if you charge £9, you sell, well, half an item. I don't know how accurate that would be. Maybe it means there's a 50% chance that you sell something, a 50% chance that you sell nothing at all. But at 10, it looks like zero. In other words, if you try charging £10 per item, no one's going to buy it. They're going to say, I'm sorry, that's too expensive. £10, that's crazy. £10 for a cup of coffee, we're not going to buy it. Maybe if you charge £8, the occasional person will say, well, it's expensive, but I'm in an airport and I'm thirsty, so I'll get one. Um, but you might be pricing yourself out of the market. You might be charging too much money for a commodity that nobody thinks is worth buying. But more than £10, well, our model starts to go below the axis. That suggests that a negative number of people buy it, which obviously doesn't make sense. So this is a case of, I suppose you could think of it like extrapolation and interpolation. In fact, that's how these lines generally get generated in the first place. Somebody will try charging different amounts of money, or maybe they'll do a survey and ask people, would you be prepared to buy such and such for this amount of money? And they'll see how many people say yes or no. When they've got some data on that, then they join it up with a line. They use their linear regression methods like we did in the first semester, and they'll construct a straight line equation, which will essentially be a link between P and Q. But if you extrapolate too far beyond the information you've got, you're gonna run into problems. And generally speaking here, we're not gonna to think too carefully about exactly how the line gets generated. In any questions you get in this semester, the line will be provided for you. So there won't be too much messing around with raw data that you need to find approximate lines for. But it's worth thinking about how you do that if I gave you just a few key bits of information. The thing to be aware of is what happens at the limits. So if you charge more than £10, it basically means nobody's going to be buying the product. And if you charge zero, five people buy it. Well, this again is not necessarily realistic or um, sensible. If something is free, um, it turns out that our brains behave very, very differently for something which is free compared to even something that costs a tiny amount, like a single penny or a single cent. Something about the fact that it's entirely free and costs us nothing requires no investment, no theoretical interpretation of value. If it's free, then people will snap it up like nobody's business. And companies like this, and they use it, we will give an unnecessarily high value to free things. That's why when they have an offer like buy two, get one free, we're much more likely to purchase the product because even though we end up having to pay and the overall effect is equivalent to buy three of these, get a third off, we don't see it in the same way. But again, we're not gonna get into any of those subtleties. If you're curious, I've got a book you can borrow at some point when we're all back in the same college. Um, but for now, essentially what this is saying is the maximum quantity you can sell is going to be five. But realistically, you're never going to charge zero because before you reach that point, you'll get to the point where you're charging the customer less than you're making than the cost of making the product yourself. So it wouldn't be worth doing. How much would I need to charge to sell four items? You can get information like this by going from the graph. In fact, this one is just a working backwards from quantity four down to a price of two. And you could do a similar thing. If I said I want to sell one item, what's the amount that I would need to charge in order to sell just one item? That will be eight pounds. So you can go forwards or backwards with this, but usually we think in terms of for a given price, how much would I end up selling? And when you've got that information, you can start working with it and using it to do more sophisticated things. The next thing I want to show you is the spreadsheet that's been produced. You can use this to investigate demand functions. You can modify the values up in these boxes. And when you put numbers in of your own, it will show you the different graphs. So if you get confused with a the question, then you can try putting the numbers in here, see what happens. It'll let you use X and Y instead of P and Q if you prefer, help you get to grips with it. And it will show you the different forms that your line equation might take. Sometimes they're written in the form of a P and a Q in order. Sometimes Q and P are in the opposite order. Um, it's not a deliberate attempt to trip you up, but it's something to ensure that you are consciously aware of which one is going to be the dependent variable and which one the independent variable. 
And then occasionally you'll see it written more like this. This is the y equals something x plus something form. Um, and that one's probably more useful if you're interested in the gradient. The gradient here is minus two thirds, for instance. But actually, the other two tend to be easier to work with when you're trying to draw the line yourself. So we'll go through some of the fundamentals, the easiest way to draw a straight line, and I'll talk through how it works here. To start with, you identify the independent variable. So if you're dealing with x and y, the independent variable will be x. If you're dealing with p and q, the independent variable is p. The price does not depend on the quantity. The quantity depends on the price. So the independent variable is p, and that will go on the x-axis or the horizontal axis. Next, you set each variable to zero and solve to find where the line crosses each axis. What that means is if you have 2p plus 3q equals 30, you replace p with zero and you get zero plus 3q equals 30. And then when you simplify that and solve it, you get q equals 10. And that's where this zero 10 point comes from. When p is zero, q is 10. And that's a point you can mark on your graph. Just put a little cross there. And you do the same thing by replacing q with zero instead. You have 2p plus nothing equals 30. Therefore, when q is zero, p is 15. As soon as you've got two different points on a graph, if you know that you're trying to draw a straight line, two points is enough to draw the entire line. If you want to test that your line is valid, you might want to try putting some other numbers in. So you could say, well, what happens when p equals 10, for instance? You'd have 2 times 10 add 3 times something equals 30. And it would end up saying 3q equals 10. So q equals well, about 3 and a third. And you can then check that if you look on your graph when p is 10. Yes, it looks like it's a little bigger than 3, something like that. So it can verify for you. But generally speaking, putting in 0 is the quickest, easiest way because it gives you the two points on the axes and then you just join the two up with a straight line. And that is how you draw a straight line graph. One quick note, if we're doing a graph that links price and quantity, you should expect a negative gradient. You'll be drawing a bunch of other lines, and one of the reasons I'm focusing a lot on straight lines at the moment is that it comes up when we do linear programming slightly later on as well. But for now, the straight line we're dealing with links price and quantity. So as the price goes up, you would expect the quantity you can sell to go down. And that's why we have a negative gradient. This line is sloping downwards because as you increase the price, you decrease the quantity. Um, just a quick tip. If you're um, wondering how this model can be improved, there are lots of more sophisticated economic models for how price and quantity are linked. And depending on the product you're dealing with, sometimes there's a very strong connection between price and quantity, and sometimes there's a very weak connection. If I go out to buy milk tomorrow, and milk is twice the price that it is today, I'm still going to buy exactly the same amount of milk because I'm going to drink the milk. My kids are going to drink the milk and milk is not that expensive. It would have to get to about five times the price probably before I start thinking, well, maybe there's a cheaper alternative somewhere. But if there are no easy alternatives, then generally speaking, the quantity will not change a huge amount based on the price. If, a, um, if that's the case, we usually refer to it as price inelasticity or the, the price is inelastic. Well, the quantity will not change very much based on the price. There are other things like that. Salt, for instance, it doesn't matter how cheap you make salt, even if it's really, really cheap, which at the moment it is. You can buy a lot of salt. You can buy as much salt as you need for a very small amount of money. And I'm betting none of you would notice if you went to the shops to buy salt and it was immediately 10 times the price. I'm not sure that would even register. You buy a bag of salt for pennies. But we're not going to buy more salt just because it's cheaper. That's not quite how it works. You have as much salt as you need and then you don't need any more. You're not going to stock up on 20 kilos of salt just because it's cheap. But we focus on a straight line model because it works nicely and it gives a good approximation, certainly for a, quite a wide range of different scenarios. And it's going to fit well with the sort of thing we're doing. It'll give us a good insight into how we can construct models and optimize models. And then when this gets more sophisticated and complicated, as you um, go on to higher education and perhaps learn about different models linking price and quantity, 
the same fundamental ideas behind what we're doing here will still work. You'll just get more complicated equations as you go through the steps. Next, we're going to look at an example of how this will play out. We have a business owner selling scarves on a stall. She's tried out some different prices. Maybe one day she charges £10 and she sells 200 scarves. Another day she charges £20 and she sells 100 scarves. And she plots those values on a graph. She's calculated this function. This is the demand function, 10p plus q equals 300. The first thing we're asked to do is sketch the graph of the demand function, showing clearly the points where it cuts the axes. In order to do that, step one is to recall and remember which of these is the independent variable. Quantity depends on price. The quantity she ends up selling will be directly determined by the price that she charges. So price is the independent variable here and quantity is the dependent variable. That means price will go along the bottom, the horizontal axis, and quantity Q will go up the side, the vertical axis. Next, we work out where the line cuts the axes. We do this in order to draw the line as well as to satisfy this part of the question. So if you make Q equal to zero, then you'll have 10 P equals 300. So P equals 30. And we've got a value for P. When Q is zero, P is 30. And we can plot that point on our graph. Then we could change P into zero instead. Then we'd get 10 lots of nothing, add Q equals 300. So Q equals 300. We can mark those two points on the point 30, 0, where P is 30, Q is 0, and the point 0, 300, where P is 0, Q is 300. And that's our demand curve. Hence, determine the quantity she should expect to sell if she sets the price at £25. Well, we look for £25 on the price axis. We move up to the line, and then we track along until we can determine the quantity. You can do this without the graph, but it's useful if you can do both, then your two different methods will complement one another. You'll be able to determine if you've made a slight mistake somewhere. So we also want to think about how we could use the equation itself. If the price is 25, that means P equals 25. And we can replace P in our equation with 25. 10 times 25 add Q equals 300. So 250 add Q equals 300. We can subtract 250 from each side and we get Q equals 50. We'd sell 50 scarves if we charge 25 pounds for a scarf. The next question is asking something a little bit different. It's asking for the revenue. But it still gives us a price. So we would start by saying, well, what do I know that happens when the price is five? Well, when we're trying to determine what happens when the price is five, we go to five on the price axis and we track up to the demand curve or the demand line, depending on what you want to call it. And we find the quantity 250. In order to completely answer the question, we need to think about what it means by the total revenue. If you recall, revenue is the amount of money that comes in. It ignores the costs. And just making the revenue greater does not automatically mean you make the profit greater. If you've had to sell more scarves to do that, then it might be that the costs outweigh the benefits. But we're just being asked for the total revenue, which means how much money we make. Well, we charge five pounds for every scarf and we sell 250 scarves. So we do five times 250 and that gives the total amount. So when the price is five, the quantity is 250. And if you multiply those two together, you work out the total revenue, 1,250. Make sure you understand in your head why that works. You, you sell 250 scarves. Each one costs the five pounds to the purchaser. So the price of the scarf is five. This does not take into account the cost of the scarf to me to make or to purchase for myself. It's nothing to do with how much it costs me to produce the scarf. It's all to do with how much money I get. In order to work out the maximum profit, I would need to know how much it costs me to produce scarves. And that's something we'll cover later. Final thing I want to show you is the practice questions from the spreadsheet. If you've got the straight line calculator spreadsheet, um, then I've shown you what this tab looks like, straight line calculator. Now we're looking at the straight line questions tab. If you click to the straight line questions tab, you'll be able to practice a bunch of these. 
I've kept it nice and straightforward, fairly formulaic. You'll be given an equation in one form or other. You'll notice sometimes they are written with x and then y and a number on the right, sometimes y then x and number on the right, and sometimes y equals something x plus something. And there are some with p's and q's rather than x's and y's, so you hopefully will get comfortable with both versions. Sometimes there'll be negatives in there, sometimes not. And the question is asking you to sketch the graph. I haven't got a sketch of it. It was a little too fiddly to make that work in Excel for 20 random questions, but it'll tell you where the graph ought to cross each of the axes. And it's also asking you to find the value of y when x is 2, or perhaps the value of q when p equals 3, or something like that. So you need to substitute that value in, and that will help you to see what the value of the other thing would be. This is just straight line practice, so there's not a lot of context here. We're not talking about selling scarves or making smoothies. We're just talking about a graph with x and y coordinates or p and q coordinates. But remember, when we refer to p and q, p is always the independent variable.